for your uh, introduction. Thank you for inviting me, and thanks to Andreas and Julie and more people that I know probably worked on putting this conference together. Uh, it's basically nice to get out of New York and into the heart of Red Sox Nation, so welcome to the opening day. So the conference is about human causation, so presumably what Hume thought about causation and uh, uh, what we can learn from what Hume thought about causation. Um, I think it's helpful in understanding what Hume thought about causation to think about what Hume uh, thinks about thinking about causation. That is, what he thinks he's doing when he thinks about causation and what this account of thinking about causation is. Um, and I think it's helpful to see that it, the concept of causation is for him uh, one of a family of sense-based concepts. Um, I might say some way response-dependent concepts, but I'll stick with the language of sense-based because it connects up with the 18th century way of thinking about uh, senses of things. Um, and so I'll talk for about 20 minutes about sense-based concepts other than causation. And so in that 20 minutes in, you might start thinking, see, is he ever going to start talking about causation? Um, I will talk about uh, the process by which sense-based concepts develop, it's a four-stage process, uh, and then some of the general features of sense-based concepts that result from that kind of development. Um, and then I'll talk about causation specifically as an example of a concept that has that kind of development and has those kinds of features. Um, and then I'll apply that conception of the concept uh, of causation um, to the question of whether Hume is a reductionist about causation or a realist about causation or a projectionist about causation or a skeptic about causation. Uh, uh, and then I'll uh, end by just saying a word about another sense-based concept that you might not think of uh, as being a sense-based concept that's related to the concept of causation. Okay, so here are some, oh, let me say a little bit about um, the unusual typography. Um, so I'm following the convention of using small caps for uh, names of concepts. So when you see something. Small well, caps, that's the name of the concept. Single quotation marks create names for individual words. Um, quotation marks indicate terms that are Hume's own terms, technical terms of Hume's. Italics indicate technical terms of mine that are not Hume's technical terms. So that's why this all looks so busy with <laughs> italics and quotation marks. Small caps. So here are some Humean sense based concepts. Hume doesn't use the word concept, he talks about abstract ideas. But those are concepts. That's his account of what concepts are, abstract ideas. And here are some that he says derive from senses. So the concepts of secondary qualities like blue, sweet, those that come from the external senses. Uh, and then there are concepts of aesthetic qualities. For him, the fundamental aesthetic. Uh, qualities are beauty and deformity, and those he describes as coming from a sense of beauty. Uh, then there are concepts of moral qualities. The fundamental moral qualities are virtue and vice, which he also describes as a kind of moral beauty and moral deformity, and those arise from what he calls a moral sense. Oh, that's not very good. Well, I'll tell you what that says, I think. Um, yeah, you can see it on the handout. Um, concepts of what I call principal qualities, um, that is what he calls wit and humor, which he describes as arising from a certain sense. Um, with the terms wit and humor have older meanings, just, it's just around the 18th century that they are coming to be used in the sense having to do with, the, with amusement and, uh, and worth. Okay, so I think there are four stages in the development of a sense-based concept. Uh, first, there's the repeated activa activation of a primitive sensibility. It's a 
capacity for a distinctive mental response, typically a feeling of some kind. Uh, so the concepts of secondary qualities like sweet and blue uh, arise from what he calls impressions of sensation. Uh, beauty and deformity arise from what he calls sentiments of taste. Uh, virtue and vice arise from what he calls the moral sentiments of moral approbation and disapprobation. Uh, concepts of wit and humor arise from what he describes as mirth uh, or amusement. Um, so in each case so far, there's no concept. There's just a particular kind of felt response to a particular kind of stimulus. But it's a distinctive kind of felt response. Um, that felt response is produced by a variety of different things, um, objects, physical objects, or the impressions of sensation, um, works of art or natural features for the sentiments of taste, uh, individuals, mental traits or characters for the moral sentiments, mostly stories and remarks uh, and incidents uh, for mirth. Uh, but as a variety of different things produce those same sentiments, you get the initial conceptualization, formation of the concept, through the formation of what Hume calls an abstract idea. So um, the, idea, the idea is here many different things produce similar responses. The result of that is that uh, a certain verbal reaction, called a general term, comes to be associated with each of the resembling things in such a way that when you then hear the general term, um, you are likely to call to mind, it's likely to call to mind for you, uh, a particular exemplar idea, that is an idea of one of the things uh, that produces this response. Uh, but it also makes the mind disposed to revive ideas of the other resembling items. So you have a, a general term that's associated with one idea which is an exemplar, it might be a different, for example, the concept dog might have one exemplar for me, Maxie, my favorite dog, and uh, a different exemplar for you, might even have a different exemplar for me one year than it has from another year, but um, it will have the same set of other ideas that it's disposed to produce. Uh, he says that those are resembling ideas that are revived, or disposed to revive, I call that the revival set of ideas. Uh, and it requires them not just Idly, but for use in discourse and reasoning. So, uh, if someone says all dogs are collies, and I think of Lassie, well, Lassie is a collie, but then I'll be disposed to call up other ideas of other dogs that are not collies, and I'll be able to use that in reasoning and discourse. Okay, so we have this initial conceptualization by the formation of an abstract idea. Um, but people won't always agree in their application of that general term, uh, depending on their circumstances, their perspective, their own personal qualities. They don't always respond to the same things in the same way. And we ourselves don't respond to the same things in the same way, depending on the perspective from which we are considering them, the mood we happen to be in, um, all sorts of uh, different features. That's disturbing, psychologically disturbing, to find ourselves and other people using the same uh, general term to pick out different things. And so there's a natural process of correction that occurs. And when it happens in relation to morals, he describes it as the correction of sentiments, correction of our moral sentiments. Um, and this happens because there, there's a sort of natural convergence on what he calls a standard of judgment. But the standard of judgment is an idealized two-part thing. One, a particular point of view from which to respond, and secondly, a set of qualities of an observer or respondent with which to respond. So in the case of blue, for example, colors in general, um, in the standard of taste, he says the standard is um, daylight to a man in good health. So daylight is the point of view correct the standard from which to judge the colors is daylight and the respondent features that should be present are those of health. Um, and so in fact we defer to the standard as determining what the correct application of the term is so that we can achieve greater agreement in our application of the terms. Um, the standard of taste at SA is all about um, determining what the standard of judgment or judgments of beauty and deformity is. Um, 
Um, the point of view is a point of view that he says cleared of all prejudice by imaginatively taking on the perspective of the intended audience, where it's a, a, a work of literature or a work of art. And you're supposed to, if it's, you know, if it's an aging Greek tragedy, you're supposed to put yourself in the position of the intended audience. You're supposed to judge from that standpoint, not say, well, this seems implausible to me, there are no Greek gods. And, um, and then there are a set of respondent qualities, strong sense, delicate sensibility, um, and then it's supposed to be um, improved by practice, that is making many judgments, being exposed to many works of art of this general kind, and then corrected by comparison with some of them as um, the qualities that result from doing many delicate comparisons of different works of art by strong basic responses. Uh, so only in the case of morals, the point of view is uh, the general point of view of um, those who uh, are most directly affected by the individual that's being judged. We have different degrees of sentiment because we have different degrees of sympathy, depending on how closely related we are to a person and the person that, that individual affects. So we should put ourselves in the point of view of the, those who are um, most directly affected by the individual we are judging, um, and then we should bring to bear similar qualities to a good moral judgment. We have strong moral sensibility and delicacy of taste. We should have thought about these things a big deal. Okay, so there's a standard of judgment in each of these cases. But these are often supplemented by what he calls rules, <coughs> rules for judging. These are rules that we arrive at by experience as we um, try to determine what features the things that appeal from the standard of judgment all have in common. It enables us a way to try to, there are rules for anticipating what the judgment from the idealized standpoint of the idealized qualities would be in cases where we don't uh, fully achieve that standard. And in some cases, they can also be useful rules for practitioners. So among these are the rules of art. In, um, in every realm of artistic endeavor, there are rules of art um, that for example, rules having to do with um, dramatic plotting and how tightly unified the action needs to be, um, rules for composing verse. These are things that uh, we can appeal to in justifying our aesthetic reaction. There are also things that practitioners can learn uh, as a way of improving their own production. Uh, likewise, there are oral precepts, which are rules for anticipating what the reaction of good moral judges would be. And you can utilize those in the endeavor to try to be a better person. OK, so there's this natural process of natural correction that occurs. And there's one other feature of the development of concepts, which he calls attributed relations, attributing of relations, which I think of as a kind of conceptual role. So he says, with many abstract ideas, government of the church. We often don't spread out all the many ideas that we're disposed to revive, uh, but we manage to talk sense about these topics even without uh, reviving all the relevant ideas because we've learned certain, to attribute certain relations. These are, the example he gives are inferential relations. So he says, for example, um, if someone should say, in war, the weaker always have uh, recourse to conquest, um, we don't have to spread out all the ideas. We say, no, no, I've learned that's not right. Um, in war, the weaker always have recourse to negotiation. It's the stronger who always have recourse to, uh, uh, to conquest. So that's the kind of inferential role he mentioned. Certain concepts acquire uh, accepted, established inference patterns. Um, and I think you can generalize that to a broader conceptual role that is transitions not just to other beliefs that are licensed, accepted, expected, um, but also transitions to other mental states. So when he comes to talking about morals, um, he talks about um, terms like virtue and terms for particular virtues as being taken in a good sense. And he treats that as being part of the meaning um, of the term. So if you know the term, you know that it's a violation of the idiom to um, criticize justice, for example, because that's something that's supposed to be taken in a good sense. But okay, that's a matter of accepted, uh, approved transitions to other states, uh, cognitive states, states of approval, and so forth. 
states of loving those who are um, who have the trait characterized by that term. So it's not just sense-based terms that have attributed relations, government and church, those are not sense-based terms, but they do also apply uh, to sense-based terms. And attributed relations like being taken in a good sense, they have a lot to do with how some of these sense-based concepts get to achieve normative status, that is, they get to be normative concepts. And it's a naturalist, there's a natural, natural is the count of how certain concepts achieve the status of normativity, of being evaluated concepts. So, uh, blue and sweet, not, I think. Some people might use sweet as an evaluative concept, but um, uh, that's not a normative concept. Price and virtue, that is, those are normative concepts. Beauty and uniformity, those are normative concepts. If the things you were in wit are mildly normative concepts, things are better for being witty and humorous than for not. Um, causation, not a normative concept. That is, you don't praise something by saying that it's a cause. So that something being a cause of a particular thing might be a reason to praise it, but just to say that it's a cause is not to praise it or criticize it. Okay, so that's the four-stage process. Um, and there are two kinds of sense-based concepts, the direct ones, those that arise immediately from a sense by way of the four-stage process the ones we've just been discussing so far. Uh, and then you know, what you might think of as indirect sense-based concepts. They still have some basis in sense, but they're applications of the direct sense-based concepts. So that can happen where we specify particular kinds. Um, a blue point that you know, has an atomistic view of space, so there are certain minimal items, um, and they, they can have colors. Um, so a blue point, the blue, is a sense-based concept, so the point has a kind of sense-based character. A uh, humorous story, that's just the application of the notion of humor to another subclass of things, another category of things, stories. Beautiful house, uh, justice, which is just virtue with, re with regard to the respect for property. Um, you can also get indirect sense-based concepts from uh, something that has a certain relation to the quality kicked out by the sense-based concept. So an artist, an artist is someone who produces beautiful things or tries to produce beautiful things. Um, <coughs> a virtuous action is an action that manifests or reflects a virtue. And for him, it's the primary thing of object of moral evaluation is the state of character is the virtue. Virtuous action is said to be virtuous because it expresses the virtue. Um, and then you can also get particular degrees. Um, he mentions that um, an enormity is a great vice, uh, a fall is a small vice. Okay. Presumably that's judged of by the degree of the feeling of moral disapprobation as corrected by the standard of judgment. Okay, so, so far that's just uh, the account of sense-based concepts. Um, I did, did, I'll distinguish five features of sense-based concepts. Uh, one of them is that they are semantically simple. So um, I don't mean by that that um, each idea, I mean that the exemplar is necessarily a simple idea, or that the, all the ideas in the revival set are simple ideas. That's not having any parts. Um, but rather that the way in which we get the revival set is typically not the result of performing operations on the revival sets of other concepts. So the concept of fiction arguably is semantically complex, not just because ideas of female plots with all are spatially complex, have heads and tails and legs and so on, but a typical way of getting the revival set would be to take the intersection of female fox. Likewise, blue point, back in the every idea in the revival set of the concept of blue point is simple. They're all minimal points, yeah, many parts. Uh, nevertheless, the concept of blue point is semantically complex because the way you get it is by taking uh, the revival set of the concept of blue and the revival set of the concept of minimal point and then taking the intersection of those. Okay, so because they arrive from a sense, these concepts are typically semantically simple as you don't have to master any other concepts in order to be able to develop them except insofar as your 
the point at which you arrive at a standard of judgment, we might bring con other concepts to bear in developing a standard of judgment. But the basic origin is, is uh, well, not one that requires other concepts. And you don't generate the revival set by doing combinatorial operations on other concepts. Okay, a second feature is susceptibility to what I call dual Humean definitions, so dual Humeans in italics, that's my term. Um, but definition is Hume's term. Uh, so for Hume, a definition is a specification of the ideas for which a word stands. Uh, people occasionally note that Hume objects to a definition of necessary connection as force or power on the grounds that these are synonymous terms, as people say. Wait a minute, isn't the definition supposed to give you a synonymous term? That's sort of odd to object to somebody's definition. Why well, you gave me a synonymous term? I thought that was the goal, was to give you a synonymous term. Uh, I hear a definition not aiming to give you a synonymous term, it's aiming to give you a characterization of the ideas for which a word stands. Um, and so it's supposed to be some explanation of what those ideas have in common. Um, one way of doing that is sometimes for a complex idea to break it down into parts, but that's not the only way to do it. Uh, and where you have a sense-based concept, you see there's always, uh, in principle, the possibility of giving two different styles of definition. One, the productive definition, that is, describing what all the things have in common that produce this characteristic response, without mentioning what the characteristic response is. Or a responsive definition where you characterize the ideas in the revival set as um, those that produce a certain characteristic response, you specify the characteristic response, you don't specify what the things have in common in order to produce that. So there is a productive definition of virtue. Uh, virtue is every quality of the mind that is useful or agreeable to the person himself or to others. And there's a responsive definition. Virtue is whatever mental quality gives to the spectator a pleasing sentiment of approbation. Um, so, although sense-based concepts are uh, susceptible to this style of dual definition, it's not always the case that we know what the productive definition is. Right? Not even true that we always know what the responsive definition is, since um, he implies that not everyone has a moral sense theory of virtue, according to which virtue is discerned by certain feelings, it's obvious that some people have failed to grasp even the responsive definition of virtue. They, although they utilize the concept of virtue, they have various um, uh, uh, virtuous traits in their revival set. They are unaware of exactly how it is that they have <coughs> generated that revival set. Um, and getting the productive definition, more difficult. Um, although in the, in the second inquiry, he sets as one of the goals the discovery of what the productive definition of virtue is. That's the kind of scandal that nobody's ever figured this out before. But it's on the model of figuring out what all the blue things have in common. That, that's an investigation in optics and the, and the surface structure of objects, which he's not prepared to do a particular kind of, although I have a theory about what heat of the secondary quality is. Um, he's not offering a productive definition of beauty, although he thinks that utility has more to do with it than you think. But that's that's just an observation, that's not a, a, a definition. What makes a house beautiful is that it would be useful for living. You can imagine how nice it would be for somebody to live in it. That's a lot to do with its beauty. But not everything is beautiful in virtue of its utility. Um, I just it did happen, but I don't know what uh, uh, beauty is. Uh, uniformity of its variety, but he was not accepting that. Um, he's also, he was also everybody, sort of fool's error to try and give the productive definition of humor and wit. And, uh, we am certainly not trying to do that. Uh, Hobbes characterized uh, it as sudden glory, that is, uh, humor is always a response to a sudden realization of superiority on your own part to other people. Uh, typically, when you mention that to, to people, they will laugh. And they, they think, why are they laughing? And they're laughing because, well, that's a stupid theory. I'm smarter than Hobbes. <laughs> <laughs> and that's more risk for no. Okay, so there's always the possibility of dual definitions. Thirdly, um, the kind of systematic locking of ambiguity of the term, sometimes encouraged by projection or mislocation or 
because they can believe about resemblance. So I call it systematic locking ambiguity because Locke uses terms like um, sweet, yellow, red. Um, in a way that's systematically ambiguous. He uses those terms uh, and talks about yellow as it is an idea and yellow as it is in the body. As it is an idea, it's a certain sensation, character. As it is in the body, it's uh, an arrangement of primary qualities of the insensible parts, such as to give rise to the idea or sensation of yellow. So Locke uses those terms both for what can we call perceptions in the mind and for qualities in some subject in the body. Um, so Hume does that also, does that in terms, secondary quality terms. Um, but he also does it with um, beauty, which on the one hand he describes as just being in the mind, or just in the eye of the perceiver, it's not really there in the beautiful object. Um, but then on the other hand, when he's talking about the passions, passions have to be produced by some quality that is in a subject. So if you love someone for their beauty, um, it's because um, that person is a subject in which the quality of beauty is located. So he also describes, uh, uses the term beauty for quality well, that's in a subject. Um, and the same is true of virtue and vice. Famously, he says, um, you know, look at any uh, scene where you'll never find the vice or virtue until you look within your own breast. Um, but Virtue and vice are also qualities in the subject for which you can feel love or hatred, pride or humility. So I take it, he, just following Lockean usage, thinking that that's a, a, a licensed kind of systematic ambiguity. You can use those terms either to describe the perception in the mind, or you can use them to describe the quality in the subject, which produces that perception in the mind. I don't know why that line about susceptibility to dual union definitions um, snuck back into there, but what that point should be is potential for blameless diversity from openness of the standard of judgment. Uh, so a standard of judgment is a combination of an idealized point of view and some idealized qualities from which to judge on which we converge. But it's very unlikely that we'll generally converge on a standard of judgment that is so specific that it will give an univocal response, only one correct response, for every possible stimulus. Um, so daylight, well, there's all kinds of daylight. How bright is the daylight supposed to be? What looks red in this kind of daylight? Or kind of orange in this kind of daylight? Um, uh, similarly, um, in aesthetic judgments, uh, the standard of judgment doesn't specify a particular age for the respondent uh, or a particular personal disposition. And what we find is that people at one age like one genre of literature more than others, and people one kind of people of a sort of jolly disposition like sort of jolly literature, and people more pensive uh, disposition like more pensive literature. And this is what he calls blameless diversity. You have your reaction, you have my reaction. It's not to say that anything goes. No, it's definitely better than Ogilvy. Anybody who questions that is just wrong. But on the other hand, there's a certain range for blameless diversity because of the openness of the standard of judgment. And finally, we have a kind of resistance to global error. Um, in the moral case, he says, the opinions of men in this case carry with them a peculiar authority are in great measure infallible something contradictory about saying, in a great measure, <laughs> infallible. Infallible, <laughs> in a great measure. Um, he also uses the term infinite pretty loosely also. Nearly <laughs> <laughs> infinite. A large number of things just suddenly becomes infinite. Okay. But this, what he has in mind is that um, it's difficult to, not impossible, that people should always be wrong in their application of these sense-based concept. But it requires a very special explaining how people could generally be wrong about what the virtues and vices are, given the concept of virtue and vice arises as an idealization of actual human responses. Uh, so uh, in the moral case, for example, you know, it'd be hard, 
would be hard to say. Uh, we, we were always wrong about what the blue things were. It was actually all the stop signs. Those were the blue th th things. And the, uh, the sky was actually a red thing. And we've just recently discovered this. Well, that takes quite a fancy story to explain how that could be the case. Um, um, so likewise, in the moral case, you say, you know, what the, the universal sentiments of all of you kind are about what the vices and virtues are, it's hard to see how that would be wrong. Okay, now we're really actually ready to talk about causation. Um, so causation is a sense-based concept. It goes through the same developmental stages. There's the repeated activation of a primitive sensibility, uh, capacity for certain distinctive response, it's a response to constant conjunction plus what I call an initiating perception. It's, you see A followed by B, A followed by B, A followed by B. Now here's a new A, a perception of a new A. That's the initiating perception. And you get an inference to a B. Uh, so the response is an impression of necessary connection that occurs in the transition to an idea, uh, a belief in B, which for him is a matter of having the sentiment or feeling of belief. And to believe something is to have a particular feeling, liveliness, force, and vivacity, which he also calls the sentiment of belief. So that's a slightly two part response, but on the other hand, the moral response typically is produced first by sympathy and then by the feeling of moral approbation. So um, responses can have more than one part. Um, in the case of virtue and vice, beauty and deformity, there are contrasting. Uh, mental responses, one positive, one negative, as it were. We don't have that in the case of causation. But in the case of wit, I think there's just a positive feeling of wit. There's not a negative feeling of, that's not funny. Not funny, certainly not being funny, just a matter of not feeling the sentiment of, of mirth in response to it. There's not an anti-mirth feeling. Um, and likewise, there's blue, but there's not another sentiment of anti blue or something like that. So that's not a problem. You get an initial conceptualization by formation of an abstract idea. This time it's of a relation, as opposed to picking out one thing that's blue or sweet. What we're picking out are pairs of things that stand in the causal relation. So I take it there's a determinate exemplar idea of a pair of objects, two things related as cause and effect, and a set of resembling ideas of pairs, other pairs of objects, that we are disposed to revive for use in reasoning and discourse. So that's, I think, why he can say, as he does here in uh, Treatise 2311, that we must not here be content with saying that the idea of cause and effect must arise from objects constantly united. Okay, we shouldn't just say that it arises from objects constantly united, but must affirm that it is the very same with the ideas of those objects. That is, the idea of cause and effect just is the ideas of objects that are constantly enjoying. Those are the ideas that are in the revival set. So take it just as you can perceive something being a particular shade of blue and represent it as being a particular shade of blue, with yet at, without having formed the general concept of blue. Um, you can't yet have thoughts about blue in general, but you can represent a particular thing as blue. Likewise, I think he thinks that um, you can represent two things as causally related. Animals and children, for example, can represent things as causally related by feeling the impression of necessary connection and making an inference from one to the other um, without having yet formed concept or the abstract idea of cause and effect. Once you get initial conceptualization going uh, by formation of an abstract idea, now you've got a concept of the relation of cause and effect as well as just the representation of individual things as in effect you know, being causally related. Okay, we now get natural correction. It seems required that there be a standard of judgment. It says the standard for judgments of causation is experience. I take it that's the point of view. It has to be experience broad enough to avoid unrepresentative samples about whatever the thing is that you're judging. Uh, and the qualities are just those of normal human sensitivity to similarities that you have to, you have to see things as being relatively more or less similar in the way that other people also see the same things as more or less similar in order to be affected by the same constant conjunctions of resembling objects. Uh, 
playing a large role in judgments of causation are rules by which to judge of causes and effects. There's a whole section of the treatise devoted to eight rules by which to judge of causes and effects. These are rules which are supposed to have been developed from our experience with uh, previous causal reasonings that we did or did not find to be satisfactory for exactly predicting what was going to happen next. Um, he says these are all the logic he sees fit to employ. These rules are very important, though also difficult in their application, he says. Um, and then I take it, he doesn't say this, but there are attributed relations of inferential and conceptual role. Um, these are particular inferences that are now licensed once you make a causal judgment. So if you judge that X is the cause of Y, then an occurrence of Y can be inferred from an occurrence of uh, X. Uh, as he says in the treatise, we no longer scruple to foretell a Y from an X if we judge that X is the cause of Y. Um, and there are, we also uh, license counterfactual judgments like if one had not occurred, the other would not have occurred. That features in one of his definitions of cause in the, in the first one. OK, so features of causation, if, if that's right, that, uh, the concept of cause is also a sense-based concept, arises from what he didn't call, what we would call a causal sense, a certain sort of willingness to, ability to be stimulated by constant conjunctions in order to feel the impression of necessary connections and make an inference with a lively sentiment of belief. Um, then you can expect the same features of causation. One is semantic simplicity. What's going to talk? Simplicity remembers the revival set, and now, in fact, the revival set will always consist of uh, ideas of pairs of things. Um, but the concept of causation itself, uh, we don't arrive at the revival set by performing combinatorial operations on other uh, concepts like priority, resemblance, constant conjunction. Not you first acquire a concept of constant conjunction and then use that concept in order to get yourself the concept of causation. Rather, you just immediately respond to the things that we treat, we regard as causally related. That's how we develop the concept. You could even, it, I'll say the implication that particular causal concepts like um, shoving, causing something to move by uh, pushing on it. Um, you don't have to consider that to be a complex, semantically complex concept composed of causation concept of causation plus some concept about motion. That might just be, so those examples of that might be just sufficiently salient that you simply develop your own concept of that. Uh, okay, so it would be semantically simple, susceptible though to dual human definitions, uh, the productive definition, well known, we may define a cause to be an object precedent and contiguous to another where all the objects resembling the former are placed in like relations of precedency and contiguity to those objects that resemble the latter. The definition in terms of constant conjunction, what all the causes have in common that produce the characteristic response. And then the responsive definition, the cause is an object precedent continuous to another and so united with it that the idea of the one determines the mind to form an idea of the other, and the impression of the one to form a more lively idea of the other that characterizes the response without characterizing what everything that produces that response has in common. Okay. There's also a kind of systematic blocking and ambiguity of the terms power and necessity as a percept for perception in the mind and for quality in a subject. So um, he famously notoriously did for a lot more about this uh, after lunch, says that um, power is only in the mind of the perceiver. Um, but then he also goes on to talk about the fact goes on to began the treatise by talking about um, the endeavor to discover what the powers of the mind are, which is not the powers that the mind feels, but rather the powers that the mind has by where means of which the mind does various things. He talks about powers of matter, powers of body, um, and likewise with necessity. Necessary connection is just an internal impression. Um, can't resemble anything in the object, but then he also characterizes um, constant conjunction as being what this physical necessity is. Constant conjunction along with uh, a response in the mind uh, is necessity. When he's char he characterizes uh, human voluntary actions as causally necessary. Um, he's willing to characterize causal relations as themselves being necessary. I take it that's more of the systematic locking and ambiguity. 
Um, there could be, in principle, blameless diversity from openness of the standard. Uh, but in fact, one of his rules for judging the causes and effects is a kind of universal determinism. It's the principle that um, like circumstances always produce like effects. He said like causes always produce like effects, but as he employs it, it's like, any like circumstances have to produce uh, like effects. So the result of that is he thinks there actually are a limited number of um, universal causal laws sufficient to determine uh, the future from any particular uh, starting point. Uh, and as a result of that, the diversity that there is about causal judgments is just a result of um, people's greater or lesser ability with causal inference where they're having different bases of experience or both. Um, but it's worth pointing out that the truth of universal determinism is just something he's betting on based on uh, the progress of science. And if the world were a much iffier kind of place, um, you might well see causal, you know, in such a world, you might see causal judgments taking on a, a kind, much more kind of aesthetically blameless, diverse sort of nature. You know, you think of that as causal, and I think of this as causal. Um, none of it's entirely deterministic. Okay, I find there's a kind of resistance to global error. Um, although we certainly differ in our judgments about what things are causally related, um, there's a kind of global error that can, we can't, in general, be wrong about um, the most obvious features of, uh, of nature and human life. And the corollaries, he draws four corollaries from the, his definitions of cause. They're basically about um, the impossibility of having constant conjunction without causation. If you've got constant conjunction, then you've definitely got causation. That's, that's explained by what it is that all the ideas in the revival set of so causation have in common. Um, so he says there's only one kind of cause. But the suggestion that there are constant conjunctions which, however, exemplify no causal relation, no real causal relation, that's the doctrine of occasionalism. Um, we can just see that that's wrong, that there's constant conjunction, that's enough for causation. And likewise, it couldn't turn out that A caused B, even though they were not an example of some constant conjunction, just this particular A caused this particular B. We couldn't be wrong about that sort of thing. Okay, so there are at least there are three modes of interpretation of human causation. Um, Reductionism, I've characterized these as claims about true causal descriptions. So reductionism takes the, the approach that constant conjunction is all that matters for true causal descriptions. Realism is the approach that true descriptions of causality are not limited to mere constant conjunction, but involve something more. Intentionally ambiguous, but involve something more. Uh, projectivism is the approach that descriptions of causality are projections onto the world of something that exists only in the mind. You might think that skepticism is another interpretation according to which we just don't know what we ought to say about true causal descriptions. Or we say contradictory things about true causal descriptions. <laughs> so I think understanding the nature of the concept of causation, how it arises, um, how we apply it, the kind of resistance to global error that it has, um, helps to see there's something right about each of those approaches, but something right having to do with a different aspect of causal descriptions. So the psychology of causal descriptions, right, that's kind of projectivist, that is projecting out of the world something that is in the mind. So he said there's a pervasive mislocation of impressions of necessary connection that occurs in causal attributions. Passage. The mind has a great propensity to spread itself on external objects. Jennifer will talk about this passage too. And to conjoin with them any internal impressions which they occasion. The same propensity is the reason why we suppose necessity and power to lie in the objects we consider, not in our mind that considers them. Okay, so we take the impression of necessary connection, an internal impression, and treat it as though it were located in a feature of quality of the cause and the effect themselves considered as a, as, as a pair. So that's a projection onto the world of something that's actually only in the mind. And it leads to a conflation of the necessity of causes with a different kind of necessity, the intrinsic necessity 
of causal relate of uh, relations of ideas. So it's relations of ideas that undermine uh, that underlie uh, demonstration. Okay, so, uh, two plus two is four. That's a relation of ideas. Uh, the Pythagorean theorem. That's a relation of ideas. Leaving aside worries about the exact status of geometry, this sort of thing would be a relation of ideas. Um, Necessity for him is kind of unthinkability of the alternative, or what produces it, uh, unthinkability of the alternative. Uh, relations of ideas depends on, in, the necessity of relations of ideas depends on intrinsic features of those ideas themselves. And it's absolutely unthinkable that two plus two not be four. Uh, the necessity of causes, on the other hand, it's a psychological unthinkability not quite, you can't separate the idea of the cause from the effect. You can. Um, it's very difficult. You're likely to think you can't. You should try hard enough. Um, and you really can't separate belief in the occurrence of the cause, the lively idea of the cause, from the lively idea of belief in the effect. Um, so because we locate the necessity, mislocate the impression necessary connection in the objects themselves, we think that it's an intrinsic kind of necessity, like relations of ideas as opposed to a psychological necessity that derives from custom and habit. So we conflate those two kinds of necessity. That's a bad thing. Um, but it doesn't mean that our causal judgments aren't true. Many of them are. They characterize um, as part of the revival set of the concept of cause, things that really are located there when judging from the standpoint of the standard of judgment. Um, it's also true that causal attributions express the disposition to make causal inferences by way of the inferential conceptual role of causation that we mentioned. Um, so some projectivists, um, Blackburn, for example, would say it, what we're doing is projecting a disposition to causalize. That is, we're really expressing, uh, we're not, when we say that it, X is the cause of Y, we're not really making a judgment that represents some state of affairs in the world, rather we're expressing our willingness to make causal inferences and we'll characterize it as correct or incorrect depending on whether that particular inference meets the normative standard for this. So it's true that, that we are expressing a disposition to make causal inferences. Um, but that's not all we're doing. Okay. The semantics of causation is in a way realist in the sense that um, constant conjunction is not synonymous with causation. Um, neither of the two definitions of cause is synonymous with the term cause itself. That's good because the two definitions are not synonymous with each other and treat them as parallel to each other. They're also not synonymous with the concept of cause. It's an empirical discovery that each of those definitions correctly characterizes the class of things that are causes. Uh, and Hume has a notion of supposing something. To suppose something is to behave as if one believed it. Uh, so for example, when you um, make predictive inferences about the future based on the past, you suppose the uniformity of nature. That doesn't mean you form the belief nature is uniform and then use this high level general proposition in making an inference. Right? Children and animals so form the general conceptual judgment nature is uniform. Um, but in making inductive inferences, they act as though they believe that. So, actually believing something is one way of supposing it. That's, that's the way of behaving. Um, so, the idea that there's something, that there's really something beyond constant conjunction, that there are secret causes of ultimate causal principles beyond constant conjunction, that can be supposed. The typical way, of, in fact, we do often suppose it. Oh, might even say it's part of the conceptual role of causation that we typically suppose this. Uh, the typical way in which it happens is just by conflating the necessity of causes with the demonstrative necessity of relations of ideas. If you treat those, if you don't draw a distinction between those, then you are in effect supposing that they are the same. Um, if uh, I ascribe various things to Senator McCarthy, some of which are uh, anti-communist crusading and some of which are anti-Vietnam War crusading, um, it's, I'm supposing that Joseph McCarthy and Eugene McCarthy were the same person, not that I formulated this belief, but I'm just acting as though that were the case. Uh, and likewise, if people 
often suppose that there's something more to causes beyond positive conjunction, that there's something intrinsic to causes and effects themselves, which grounds their necessity uh, simply by conflating these two kinds of necessity. Uh, but it's also possible to make a sort of imperfect attempt at a relative idea of some unknown kind of necessity. So can't yeah, form a relative idea uh, when we have an idea of a relation and one of the things we want to be related and not an idea of the other thing that's supposed to be related except that it's supposed to play this role. So you have a relative idea of um, Sally's brother by having an idea of the brother relation and the idea of Sally and that's in a way sufficient. That's an imperfect idea because it's got an empty place uh, in it. Um, so he allows that, I mean, since we talk about secret causes and ultimate principles beyond mere constant conjunction, um, we're not merely gargling when we say those things. There is something going on mentally when we, uh, when we talk about those things. And what's going on is an attempt to formulate some relative ideas. Um, but it depends on an unknown species of necessity because we already understand demonstrative necessity and we already understand causal necessity. It's the necessity that arises from constant conjunction. Um, so what we're doing is, in effect, postulating there's something else which, if we were familiar with it, would be sufficiently similar to uh, the necessities that we know that we'd also call it necessity. Or uh, we are supposing that there are other kinds of ideas other than the ideas that we have, but sufficiently similar to ideas that we think of them as ideas if we had them, and which would show there to be some kind of demonstrative relation between causes and effects. So it is possible to have thoughts about, or suppositions of, um, aspects of causation beyond constant conjunction. It's not some kind of analytic truth that causation is just constant conjunction. Um, but what we do know, about the epistemology of causation is something that you might consider reductionist. That is, constant conjunction is necessary and sufficient for causation, whether any other conditions are satisfied or not. So people who represent Hume as being a metaphysical realist about uh, causation uh, want to say that if there were cases of constant conjunction that lacked this further connection, that would be a case of constant conjunction without causation. But in fact, Kim's view, based on the nature of the concept of causation, is that if you had a constant conjunction without anything else, that would be causation without and anything else. The way the concept of causation works is constant conjunction is necessary and sufficient for it. Doesn't mean that there that must be all there is to the relation between causes and effects. There may be some other feature of causes and effects which has as a consequence that they are constantly conjoined. But necessary and sufficient for causation is the constant conjunction. And you see that in many aspects of Hume's philosophy in the four corollaries, the definitions of cause, where he says they're just one kind of cause because if you've got constant conjunction, then you've got causation. If you don't have constant conjunction, then you don't have any kind of cause at all. There's no, there are no degrees of necessity because if you've got enough constant conjunction to produce inference, you've got causal necessity. If you don't have that much constant conjunction, then you don't have any causal necessity. Uh, there's a, we can now appreciate, he says, uh, that there's no demonstration that everything in existence must have a cause. Once again, that's because Constant conjunction is necessary and sufficient for causation, and you can always conceive that that should fail to um, pull between any two things, not be constant conjunction between them. Um, likewise, the belief is constrained by conception. Those are, that's the final corollary. Those are all instances of the requirement that constant conjunction be necessary and sufficient for causation. Um, you also see it in his um, argument that human actions are causally necessitated by circumstances, motives, uh, uh, and traits of character, simply on the grounds that those things are constantly controlling particular kinds of action. That's sufficient to determine that they are causally necessary. Uh, likewise, we can tell that there's mind-body interaction simply on the grounds that there's constant conjunction. That's sufficient to determine that um, there's interaction between mental states and bodily states. 
Okay, so um, but that means metaphysics of causation. That's the question. So, but what is the relation between causes and effects? Um, is it just constant conjunction? So here I think his view is skeptical. Uh, so here's what he says in the treatise, false philosophers have sufficient force of genius to free themselves from the vulgar error that there is a natural and perceivable connection between the several different sensible qualities and actions of matter, but not sufficient to keep them from ever seeking for this connection in matter or causes. As they followed upon the just conclusion they have returned back to the situation of the vulgar, they were regarding all of these dispositions with indolence and indifference. He recommends indolence and indifference with the question with respect to the question of where is the location of the of causal power, what else is going on, if anything, besides cause to conjunction. Um, in the first inquiry, he says the skeptic justly insists that we have no other idea of this relation than that of two objects which have been frequently conjoined together. Uh, even though we want there to be more, we typically suppose that there is more. But uh, one aspect of the mitigated skepticism that he recommends is that a correct judgment, avoiding all distant and high inquiries, confines itself to common life, to such subjects as fall under daily practice and experience. Um, so high, distant and high inquiries includes things like the origin of worlds, um, but it may also have to do with the underlying character of the relationship between causes and effects. Certainly, he took that to be a skeptical topic uh, in the passage mentioned just before. So, everybody's right about something. Projective is right about psychology. Realist right about semantics. Uh, Reductionist right about epistemology. And the skeptic is right about the metaphysics. That is, we're not going any further there. At least we don't have to. Okay, so I promised one preview of a fourth sense based, you know, sixth sense based concept. Um, and that's probability. Um, here are two passages in which you most strongly suggest that probability is a sense-based concept. All probable reasoning is nothing but a species of sensation. It's not solely in poetry and music we must follow our taste and sentiment, but likewise in philosophy. When I am convinced of any principle, it is only an idea which strikes more strongly upon me. When I give the preference to one set of arguments above another, I do nothing but decide from my feeling concerning the superiority of their influence. So, and likewise, belief is more properly an act of the sensitive than of the cogitative part of our natures. So, that suggests is that the ability to feel the force and vivacity of an idea, belief, that is a kind of sense of probability. That's how you feel how probable the thing is. It's more force and vivacity, the more, um, the more probable it is. Now, that has to go through a process of conceptualization, correction, attributed relations, and then the concept of probability will have the features that sense-based concepts generally do. Um, I'll just mention the last three. Um, you see in him a systematic blocking and ambiguity of the term evidence that we talked about. Uh, preserving the evidence through a long argument means the psychological evidence, the liveliness of the idea. But also in the first inquiry, he talks about the wise person's proportioning belief to the evidence. In the subjective sense, that would just be proportioning belief to itself, or the internal evidentness to the internal evidentness. Um, but there he's talking about the external circumstances which produced that feeling of evidence. Um, there's potential for blameless diversity in assessments of degree of probability from openness of the standard of judgment. Um, I'll just suggest without arguing um, that that's a large part of what's going on in the dialogues concerning the actual religion, where we established that the standard, uh, particularly for analogical probability, is quite open, and that there are people with, who have one temperament, anti temperament, that of philosophical views. Other people have the temperament of Philo, philosophical skeptics, and they ascribe somewhat different degrees of probability to the judgment that uh, the cause and order in the universe is, um, in some ways, like human intelligence. And they can be friends about that. They're like people who disagree in, in aesthetic respects. There's also the possibility that um, people have different reactions to metaphysical realism even after they know all of what we just described. Some people just sort of still do really feel that there's some higher degree of probability to metaphysical realism than other people do. 
not much turns on it, I think, Newton thinks. And so, Pontius looked around for blameless diversity there too, although he does seem to recommend um, skepticism about that topic. And finally, there's a kind of resistance to global error about probability. So in the moral case, where he said, the response to people who deny the reality of moral distinctions is just leave them alone for a minute. Because their lively sense will show them that there is a distinction between vice and virtue. They're just trying to, you know, they're just, they're just trying to annoy you in some way. And if you just leave them to feel the sentiments, they'll see that there's a real distinction between virtue and vice. That's very similar to what he says in the last section of book one of the treatise, where there's a moment in which he says it seems to him that nothing is more probable than anything else. That's a moment of questioning the reality of probability distinctions, whether anything is really more probable than anything else. Um, but as we know, sense and the ability to feel distinctions of probability returns, and it's hard, in the end, it's hard to see how we could all have always been wrong about whether some things were more probable than others. Thank you. Five minute break. And then hard five minute break. <laughs> Not one of those seven minutes. No.